Hey everybody, how y'all doing today? This is DB coming back at you, South Louisiana. Uh, there's one very important thing that I want to discuss in this video, and it is involving the infamous <laughs> C39V2. And um, the, the video is, you know, a few different things I want to talk about, but first, I experienced a, a failure. And that failure was the very first failure that I had ever experienced. Um, and I define failure as pulling the trigger and the round not going off. Um, that's where it starts. I mean, it, it could go off and, you know, fail to eject, fail to feed another round, double feed. Everything starts from pulling the trigger and... You know, it being in full battery, pull the trigger, primer's ignited, round goes down range, ejection. If that doesn't happen to the fullest extent, that is a failure. Um, but it is, it is very key that I explain what happened in this failure and be very detailed in that failure. And then I'm also going to, um, you know, provide some pictures. A lot of people want to know, you know, like wear and tear update, how's the bolt? bolt carrier group, bolt itself, how's everything handling, um, you know, the, the wear and tear, the update, whatnot. Um, I am, and I, I'm not, guys, I'm, <laughs> I'm not keeping an exact count, but um, I do know for 100% sure that I'm somewhere between 2,500 to 3,000 rounds on this rifle. And this is more than likely, um, very very accurate I'm gonna say probably 2700 I, I would say would be a fair estimate um, I've, I got a, a box full right here and this is just a fraction of cases that I've picked up at the range or picked up you know wherever I shot I don't like to leave my steel just laying out there to be you know rusting and everything so uh, and I've only ever shot steel through it so the uh, the failure. Let's get in. Let's get into details about what happened. The uh, the, the Magpul MOE stock. This little guy right here. There is what well, what comes with it is this little uh, wedge block, for lack of a better term. But on on the inside of the wedge block. There is a recess, and I'm trying to get it to where you can see, but there's a recess for a nut to go right there, and this feeds through, and this, this is kind of in between, you know, the rear of the receiver and the inside of the stock. And what it's supposed to do is keep, I guess, keep pressure when you tighten this up, it's keep pressure on the stock and keep it from backing off. And... You know, hey, I mean, the, the direction said to put it in. I mean, it even has some, some thread locker that comes with it. I didn't add that. And, uh, you know, it, it was on there. I, I had checked it on more than one occasion to make sure it was still tight, including the actual mounting bolts and everything that are on the, the top of the rear of the receiver and everything that actually hold it in place. Now... I was out with a buddy of mine, and we were we were shooting um, some old some old wooden furniture that uh, he didn't want anymore, and uh, you know, we were just having a blast. It was like some some old wooden tables and chairs that were falling apart and shit, and you know we were just tearing it up. He had his AK-74, I had the 7.62. We were you know comparing entry and exit on the wood, and you know just you know next best thing to Mikhail Kalishnikov coming out himself with, you know, a bottle of vodka and uh, us just having a great time, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, during the course of this, um, pulled the trigger and no bang. And I was actually very, very caught off guard because, like I said, it is something that has never happened to me in the course, and the phone ringing here, it's never happened to me in the entire course of any round that I've ever fired, other than it going bang, going down range, and ejecting, 
Next round goes in the full batter. It feeds properly. Nothing ever happened other than that until this day. So I was kind of freaked out. You know, I mean, so what? But what ended up happening was this: the this little recess where that nut is, or where the nut is supposed to be. Um, apparently, um, this this backed all the way out into the stock, and that nut fell into the receiver itself. And apparently, somehow or another, that little nut. Um, wedged its way in between the hammer and when I pulled the trigger the nut actually prevented the hammer from striking the back of the bolt and thus prevented it from hitting the firing pin and I heard the you know click like the hammer came forward but it never made contact your first instinct if you know your experience with AKs is you you remove the magazine and you know, keep, keep the barrel pointed in a safe direction for, you know, 10 seconds. Maybe you got a slow burning primer, you know, you don't want to pull the breech back and there be, you know, one of those that blow up in your face. So that didn't happen. So I pulled the handle back, round fell on the ground, picked the round up, inspected the round. I noticed that that round was never touched. There was no, there wasn't even a light primer strike on the round which indicated to me that there was actually something preventing it. At that point, I, you know, when messing around with the rifle, I noticed, hey, there's something loose in here. So I, I popped the top of the cover off, and I'm going to try to show you as best I can. Uh, clear. I'm going to pop this off so you can see real quick. Give me one second. All right, so I'm gonna take this little deal off here. All right, so looking in through here, that is where, let me get my flashlight. If you can see, see that hole right there? That's where that little bolt goes through. And if you look inside, inside here, that is where that little wedge block sits, right there where that little hole is. So that nut came through, and actually, some I'm guessing somehow or another, prevented the hammer from striking the, the firing pin like it's supposed to. And apparently when I took the magazine out, the nut fell out of the receiver. I never did recover the nut. I have no idea what happened to it. Uh, like I said, I couldn't recover it to see uh, if maybe it did get slapped by the hammer, I, I couldn't find it, looked all over, even got a magnet, couldn't find it. I have no idea what happened to the nut. And uh, that bothers me. <laughs> but it's uh, it wasn't the gun's fault, I guess is the point. Um, and, you know, hey, I'm not an idiot. I do periodically check to make sure that everything stays tight and the way it's supposed to be. And, I mean... They got a decent amount of, of a thread locker on this thing, and you know it does not instruct you to use uh, any additional thread locker, any Loctite or anything like that, to my knowledge, and I haven't actually gone and double-checked the instruction manual that comes with the stock. I mean, common sense says to me if they're providing thread locker that it's probably not necessary to use more because you may one day want to change your stock. And if you're using some heavy duty thread locker, it might be in a bind. So anyway, uh, moving forward, um, like I said, somewhere in the vicinity of 2,500 to 3,000 rounds, I'm estimating um, 2,700 to be the magic number. Um, the AKT uh, trigger that is on this thing, I give it 100% five stars, absolute best trigger you can ask for. Um, the, everything about it I like, and I haven't had any trouble with it. It was a it was a very easy install, and uh, I did on, on the on the hammer. There is a spot, and I'm going to roll in some pictures here in a second. Um, 
and kind of do my best to narrate them. The uh, there is kind of like a double hump on the on the hammer, and uh, some people were kind of concerned about that um, profiling the back of the carrier on that little tang that sticks out, and the way the hammer hits it, and it rubs on that little high point, and there and maybe causing some additional um, you know, I don't want to say mushrooming, but causing some additional compressing of that tail. And a lot of people have profiled those hammers, even on factory hammers, you know, whatever trigger you're running necessarily, but they're profiling that hammer. They're taking out that little second hump on the back where the actual claw grabs, you know, closer to that claw. And uh, I found that to work very well, not only for it, the way that it, uh, interacts with the tail as it pushes the hammer back but the uh, the actual action when when the carrier comes back when the front of where that bolt sits where the first part is going to ride back over the hammer on the way back it doesn't lift it up momentarily before coming back down so it's a lot smoother at that point um this is where i'm gonna start rolling in the pictures guys um and I'm trying to keep this as short as sweet as possible, but I also want to be as detailed as possible because a lot of people out there, um, I think it's probably primarily due to the concerns of the cast trunnions on the RES-47 and not so much the actual milled, you know, a uh, little bit better, a little bit more beefy C-39 V2, you know, it, it, it seems to be kind of like night and day with these things so and, and some people kind of categorize them together because they're both made by the same company and they say oh, okay well it's just a stamp version of the same rifle I, I don't know I can't speak to that but all I know is what I'm about to show you is what these pictures were taken just before I started this video and I'm using my iPhone camera it's it's not the best but they are you know, very clear, close up, and I have 18 different pictures. Uh, first one is a view of the front trunnion from the top, and um, you can see on that right side, you know, the charging handle side rail, there is a little uh, spot of wear right there. And I've paid really, really, really close attention to this as it has developed and once I got to about a thousand rounds, the that spot seemed to just stop. There was no more additional wear or anything with that. Uh, the next picture is from the side view, same thing, the front trunnion. Um, the now the other side, looking at it from the charge and handle side across. Um, the there's not really anything going on in there. I mean, there there is some polishing where the finish has been, you know, over time has been taken away from, you know, that, that's a lot of rounds. I mean, you know, it's not a not a 5K torture test necessarily, but it is, you know, we're getting up there for the average shooter in not even a year's time. I've, I've put 2,700. Most people are not going to do that, you know, and I mean... Some people, some people will say, "Oh, well, you know, that's that's totally normal." But let's be honest. You know, most people buy these rifles, and they they buy one thing of ammo. They go shoot whatever ammo they have, and then that's it. They may or may not clean it. I would imagine most people do. Um, but you know, there are people, those hardcore people out there that, oh, you don't need to clean AKs. That's ridiculous. It's a piece of equipment at the end of the day, and every piece of equipment is going to treat you how you treat it, period. Um, there's no perfect rifle. There are some that are better than others, but there is no rifle that can be abused and neglected, not cleaned, dog shit. You know, it, it's, it's just not going to happen. If you have any sort of respect for your rifle, for yourself, as a gun enthusiast, as somebody who is in that sort of community and that camaraderie, you're going to take care of your weapon. I mean, 
you know, I understand the point of the torture test because you want to know at which where what is the breaking point. You know, what can what can I do? What can I not do? And those are good tests. There's nothing wrong with those tests, but they are for the average person unrealistic. So for someone who plans on shooting their rifles, you know, one week in a month, you don't need to be worried about a 5K torture test. Okay? <laughs> and don't draw any conclusions on what is going to happen to your rifle based on a 5K torture test or whatever. You know, if, if you're not going to throw your rifle into a ravine and, you know, or run over it or do anything like that, then you don't need to worry about it. It's entertaining to watch, and I, like I said, I understand the reasons that they do that test, but it's not for the average shooter to worry about and to really be concerned about, okay? So, moving on in the pictures, um, the front of the bolt, and it's kind of an angled view, um, let's see, yeah, the bolt face, the locking lugs, piston head, and there's some there's some polishing and there there is some wear that you can see on the bolt, and yeah you know there there is some wear but looking at it seeing what it looks like and then actually putting in a no go gauge and checking the headspace those are two totally different things I can look at the bolts oh it's wearing out. But if it still has some pressure on, you know, checking headspace, if it still has some pressure to close on a live round or a, or a go gauge, and it does not close on a no-go gauge, well, it really doesn't matter what it looks like. I mean, if, if it's headspace properly, then it's, it's safe. I mean, that's, that's the overall thesis is that the gauges, and you know, and you, and you use multiple gauges to be 100% sure, but... Don't worry about what it looks like. Worry about if it headspaces. You know, that's the main concern. And I think that kind of falls into the other thing that I was talking about is that your average person doesn't have a set of gauges. So they're judging on what they're seeing and then they're comparing that to, you know, maybe what somebody else is saying and then they think they have a legitimate problem, but maybe they don't, you know. And the only way to really know is to check your headspace. So, uh, moving on with the pictures, uh, the tail of the carrier, um, and then the uh, kind of an, an overall picture of the finish. Uh, one thing I will say is I haven't found, as far as I know, I haven't found a, a rifle with a, a prettier finish. I mean, the, the right, this rifle's finish is beautiful, and it's held up extremely well. Um, here's the uh, close-up of the left side, you know, where the, uh, where the rail mount would be. Um, I'm not a fan of those. I haven't gotten one. I don't see the point with the Texas weapon system uh, cover rail. Kind of pointless. Um, the MOE stock, the stock is holding up really well. Like I said, the only issue I had was the the fact that that little wedge block nut either backed out or bro. I honestly don't know. I mean, the, the, the bolt is, is okay. So I'm assuming it just came loose somehow, some way, which is kind of remarkable. I mean, I'm, I don't know how that happened, to be honest. Um, maybe it's my fault, but I know that I do check tightness. I'm, I'm not an idiot, <laughs> you know. Um, but I just find that amazing that even with that thread locker, that fucker backed all the way out and actually fell into the receiver and caused a malfunction that otherwise would not have happened. I actually took that same round that failed to fire, put it back in and fired it, no problem, after that happened. So, and and continued to fire the rifle beyond that and still have not had an issue since. Um, the uh, Looking at the handguard, um, the gas block, the pins, the front sight, uh, the right side of the front sight, uh, gas block pins, all the pins are beautiful. Um, there, there's no issues with any deformities or, or deformation anywhere. Um, and the actual, you know, safety side, charge and handle side of the, of the entire rifle. Um, the, 
The last picture is a look kind of from the side at a at the mag release and the mag well, and uh, you know, again some of the fit, some of the finish is wearing off on the actual top part of the mag release button where the catch is that actually locks. You know when you hear the click, so, but that's gonna happen. I mean I do have quite a few steel mags and I'm assuming it's you know from those. Um, last but not least. Um, this is the part that really the only part that matters is the headspace check and what I use or what I will use is an unfired cartridge with the projectile removed this has not been fired primer still intact and some people say well why would you use that fair question um, I feel much safer about checking it with a live round without the projectile present common sense you know no powder yeah there's a primer but to me that's that's okay I mean you can you, you can do whatever you want um, a go gauge would be a little bit easier but the issue I have with go gauge versus actually using a, a, a live round not a, not a live round but an actual cartridge is this is going to give you a more realistic headspace because it's actually you know sitting in the chamber a short ways and this is what you shoot you don't shoot go gauges so I just feel like this is a more for me for me look hey everybody's gonna have a different method some people use the tape method some people you know just use the go gauge. Um, some people will go as far as taking out the extractor and the firing pin and still use a live round. I understand all of those ways are valid and there's nothing wrong with any of those ways. This is just my way of doing it. And I'll also have a no go gauge right here. Not sure how well you can see that, but right there, no go. Okay. So what I'll first do is uh, just take the rifle down and uh, put the live cartridge. I keep saying live cartridge. It's not really a live cartridge, but you get what I'm, you get the point. Okay, clear. Break it down, and it's good to use the bolt and carrier together because you can get a better idea of, of how much pressure it really takes to close or not close um, on the gauge or, or what have you. So take this out and first things first, <clears throat> take the, the live round and what we're gonna do is, it's kind of tricky but what I do is I actually put the carrier in and I get it just past the ejector on the inside to where it's sitting about right there. And then you can insert that cartridge from the bottom and then you can check that, that uh, on the live round that way. And it's not the easiest thing in the world, but it's pretty much the, the only way to do it. So I got it in there. As you can see, it is riding with, and it's underneath the extractor claw. So the game is on these is it should take somewhere between zero and 30 pounds of pressure for it to close on a go gauge or a live round. Okay. Now without a force gauge, that is impossible. But what I do is I go ahead and I take it and I just with one finger pinky pinky pressure on the very back of the receiver or the receiver the carrier and I'm going to push until I actually feel that there is some pressure okay I can't this thing's not just gonna fall in under its own pressure like it would if there was nothing in it so then you want to just guess, you know, what, how much pressure does it take? And it takes, it takes some pressure. Again, pull it out. Stops right there. 
and you can see my finger bending. There we go. So it does it does take some pressure to close, which is a good thing. You want some. If it was too tight, you'd really have to force it in there. And that's and like I said, it's impossible to know without a force gauge. So take that out. And now we're gonna go for the no-go gauge. Make sure you can see. CIP no-go. Right there. This one's a little bit easier because it does have a slot cut out so that it can bypass the ejector. Put that in there. Line it up with the slot in the bolt itself. And there we go. Put it on back in there. Okay, here we go. Now we got the no go in there. Got a good seat against the bolt face. And we're going to go again with the pinky because th this is not something you want to force. This is not something you want to try to force in and make it happen. You know, you're just going to go until you feel it right there and you cannot push this any further just so you can get a good look there's all this gap turn around maybe you can see it better from the other side absolutely will not close not going in there so this rifle is still 100% good to go and I would not judging on looks alone obviously that is not what you need to be concerned about when it comes to your headspace you need to get a gauge and hey yeah they're expensive but you need one because I do not want anybody to be in an unsafe situation with any rifle of any type, of any brand, of any sort, of any caliber that blows up in their face because they failed to check their headspace. Some people don't even know what headspace is, and it's really not their fault. You know, it's just the average person is not even concerned about that because they don't shoot it enough to even bring that up in their mind. So, you know, it, it is what it is, but this, this video is really just to try to show for probably, I'm not, I'm not an average shooter. I'm an, I'm an above average shooter, but by absolutely no means am I a professional gunsmith. I am not a, you know what I'm trying to say? I'm in that, that medium um, area where I'm not a casual shooter, but I'm also not an expert. I'm not a gunsmith, but I'm aware of a few things. I know what's going on. Um, and I want to share as much information to the average person that I possibly can with regard to these rifles. And, uh, that's really what it's all about. That's my only focus, my only concern. And, uh, if I helped even one person, um, hey, it's, it's worth my time. I know that I'm looking at the timer. I know this video has been kind of long, but, uh, I really do appreciate everyone that, uh, that is watching and that is getting some good, healthy information out of it. So, uh, if anybody has any questions, um, which I'm sure there will be, please feel free to ask in the comments, be respectful. Um, you know, no, there's no, there's no need to criticize anyone uh, in the gun community um, for whatever reason. You know, ignorance is healthy sometimes. It's opportunity to, to show someone. It's not an opportunity to bash them because of, you know, them not knowing. Well, more than likely, you did not know at one point. And, you know, now you do, either because you taught yourself or someone taught you. So, remember that. And, um... Uh, any questions, like I said, feel free to subscribe. I'm really just kind of starting this whole thing out. This is only, I want to say, my fifth video. Maybe not even that many. 
but uh, I do enjoy them. So uh, coming up on 30 minutes. God bless y'all, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.